how do we make an individualized hydration plan? Rather than just drinking a certain amount or having so much fluid or drinking to thirst, is there a way from our understanding of how hydration works that we can build a personalized plan? <clears throat> and the answer is yes. What I'm going to describe to you is the sweat test that we use for um, any and all of our uh, sweat testing. Sweat testing. It's like defining a word using the same word. We evaluate the hydration habits of any of our elite athletes that we used to test. So back when I used to be the least scientific person in the room, this is when we were testing the uh, New York Rangers in 2008. We collect urine samples, do some sweat testing, give them assigned bottles. Um, and these are a few colleagues from the, uh, the Gatorade Sports Science Institutes. So we all flew down to White Plains and uh, did this in a day, which is pretty awesome. Got some uh, sweat from Yarmir Yager and not Sean Avery. He was convinced we were there for drug testing, so he didn't want to participate. But everyone else is pretty good. So the sweat test is uh, meant to ask, one, are you dehydrated before competing? If you are, how do you fix it? How much sweat do you personally lose? Is it the average of 1.2 liters per hour or is it different? How well do you replace that fluid? So if you voluntarily drink, do you do the two-thirds fluid replacement that the typical person does? Are you trying to drink more? Do you need to be worried? Are you not drinking enough? We can analyze the sodium in your sweat. Is it the 800 milligrams per liter on average of uh, most athletes, or is it heavier? Is it lighter? Do you need to add extra salt to whatever you're, you're drinking? And then overall, how much do you lose during competition? We can also get a sense of um, how much carbohydrate you take in by, by looking at the fluid you're drinking. There's some other questions we can add, but these are the main five. And the, uh, the sweat test is shown nicely in this little promo video. You might have seen these during the, uh, all the World Junior tournaments. We would always go in uh, mid-July, mid-August, do these assessments for... Canada's World Junior Team, and they would do these little promo segments that they show during halftime, or not halftime, but during the intermissions. All right, here we go. What we're doing uh, with the sweat test is that we're applying a absorbent patch on a specific site in the body to measure the concentration of the salt in the sweat. When athletes sweat, they lose more than water. They lose sodium potassium, and chloride ions. The most important is sodium or common salt. It's important that these electrolytes are replaced during games so they um, can perform it at a high level. Uh, yeah. The results, I think, were quite interesting. We found that uh, most of the players are fairly high sweaters. They're also high salt sweaters. Uh, electrolytes are a big factor in your performance, and uh, water will replenish those fully. So um, you know, obviously, sports drinks like Gatorade is perfect. You don't uh, have those salts or have those electrolytes in your, in your system and things all that in and uh, as uh, you know, recovers quickly. Omar and Stahl are going for the, uh, the, um, the sponsorship at the end there. Nice little trip down memory lane. That's what we're trying to do is um, assess the sweat habits, the hydration habits of, uh, of these athletes. So the first thing we do when we bring them in is... Urine collection. I had a really nice picture here to show you what urine collection was, but I think you can imagine it. No, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm not showing you what urine collection is. You can imagine, and the reason we collect urine is to assess whether or not you are dehydrated initially. So if it's really concentrated, that's a sign of being dehydrated. If it's really, um, what's the opposite of concentrated? Dilute, thin, then you're well hydrated. So we have a special um, device that we can use that measures concentration based on how light moves through the fluid, or you can use a color scale like this. And believe it or not, we, we saw a few guys with really odd samples that ended up down at the bottom of this range. And it's, it's something to walk into a dressing room, bathroom, with 40 urine cups sitting on the ground. Not something I'd wish on you guys, but you can imagine it's something. So we can analyze that sample and see, okay, are you hydrated? Are you dehydrated? 
and then give them recommendations for this is what you should do to get up here. Next, everything is based on changes in body weight. So we weigh the individual beforehand with little on. We want to measure body mass. We don't want to measure um, underwear or equipment. We want body mass only. Then we apply what we call a sweat patch, but what is really um, an adhesive bandage. It's meant for wounds to collect any like seeping fluid out of wounds, but it's a clean, sterile bandage that we use to collect sweat. We put it on the, uh, the forehead here because for hockey players specifically, you tip the helmet back and you can pull it right off. But if you have greater access, you can do chest, back, forearm, thigh, calf, whatever you want to. And there's a whole host of different validation techniques, but for, uh, forehead was easiest for us. Um, monitor fluid intake. So to go with the changes in body mass, we need to know how much fluid they're drinking. So we painstakingly labeled every bottle with name and number and filled it with their fluid of preference. So we asked them, do you want water? Do you want Gatorade? Do you want G2? Whatever it is, we'll have it ready for you. And we put it up here on the boards for them during practice. At some point during the practice, we bring them over, grab the sweat patch off whenever it was full. You don't want it to get too full that it starts to leak out or that the seal breaks. So here I am uh, taking a sweat patch off that we take back to the lab and analyze. Then when everything's said and done, Way out, again, no equipment, towel down, get all the sweat off. We want to measure body weight, not body and sweat, not body and equipment. So from this procedure, which we'll do next week, and I'll give you a bit more information on that, we get a couple interesting tidbits of info. This is that fancy piece of equipment. We put a little urine sample here, and based on how light passes through, it gives us a number um, to describe what we call urine-specific gravity. That is, how concentrated is urine compared to water? If it's 1, it's the same as water. If it's 1.02, it's 1.02 times as concentrated as water. And it only ever gets to about 1.04. That's the range. And 1.02 being right in the middle of the range is our threshold. If you're there, or above 1.02, you're dehydrated, need to drink something. From weighing pre and post, and from weighing the bottles at the start and then after they've uh, drank whatever they're going to drink, we get um, sweat rate. And it's all based on the assumption that if we measure one kilogram change, that means a one liter change in fluid. So if you start at 86 kilograms, you end at 85, you lost one liter of fluid if you didn't drink anything. So we calculate sweat loss as such. How much body weight did you lose? Did you drink anything? And then did you have to pee? That's not uh, sweat that came out of your body. It was something that we have to correct for um, in, um, in calculating sweat loss. But for example, if you lose 0.5 kilograms and you, you drank 1.2 liters, so despite drinking 1.2 liters, you still lost half a kilogram during a practice, and then maybe you produced a small amount of urine. You add all that together, results in a sweat loss of 1.6 liters. If that practice was an hour, this is 1.6 liters per hour. If it was two hours, 0.8 liters per hour. So we get individualized information uh, from calculating the sweat loss of these guys or girls. We did this with the Canadian national team, uh, women's national team as well. So this is the sweat patch. We'll take a look at those. We can spin them down. There's a little centrifuge over on the left hand side that you use to pull a sweat sample out of the patch. And then we just use a little um, scale to measure how much fluid was in the bottle to start, how much is left, and the difference is how much the individual drank. The sweat goes through um, a little machine like this, which is um, used, it was, it was developed to measure and assess cystic fibrosis, because really high chloride in your sweat is one of the hallmark uh, signs of cystic fibrosis. But really high chloride generally also means really high sodium, 
and we can measure sodium concentration by inputting the sample and what this does is it sends a small electric current through it. And how quickly that sample is, con or how the, the current is conducted is proportional to the amount of sodium. So an ionic substance can conduct electricity without the ions uh, less electricity is conducted. So we get a, a reading out here uh, in millimolar, then we can calculate milligrams per liter from that. But this is pretty expensive. I think this piece of equipment costs $2,500. It's hard to carry around. You've got to plug it into a wall outlet and then let it uh, warm up and give it time to do its thing. So one of the honors projects that a student of mine did a couple years ago was um, to use these uh, saltwater pool test strips to see if we could measure sweat sodium effectively without really expensive equipment. You get 10 or 15 of these for $50 and you use them to test your salt water pool if that's what you have. And uh, she found a way to take the saturated patch, so it's still full of sweat, we haven't spun it out yet, and then she folded the patch around the end and there's a little inlet here. This is what would wick the sweat up. And you can see it, it happening in real time during this animation. The sweat's wicking up, and then when this yellow line turns black, it means it's fully uh, diffused through the sample. And then the last reading that you get where it's color changed to yellow is how much salt you have. You look on the bottle, you say, okay, a number four means this much salt. 4.2 means this much salt. So we've been able to measure pretty accurately the amount of salt in sweat using this relatively cheap and inexpensive, uh, inexpensive method. And this is something we're hoping to publish um, in the next couple months. So when we go over on Thursday and do this kind of work, you can see this in action. It takes maybe 10 minutes or so, but we'll use the actual equipment to run your sweat samples through to give you a really nice accurate reading if that's something you want to do. So what I want, I'm going to think of the, um, the statement or the question specifically for your second concept map, which is due next Friday, end of day. But I want you to think about the objectives and the uh, methods of this sweat test. So think about what you're trying to assess, what the goal of the sweat test is, and then all the different elements that help you answer those questions. So you've got five main items that were listed at the start, and we weighed the bottles before and after, we weighed the people before and after, we collected sweat with a patch, and try to put all of those together to get a few common outputs. Try to understand how those elements are related to uh, achieve the objectives as you understand them of the sweat test. So I'll make sure to put that into a nice, concise statement and post that on Moodle for you. Um, but it's all related to the sweat test and what we're going to do next Thursday. Yeah, end of day Friday should be enough time for you to work on that. We'll see. I might push it back a little bit. So we flew through this section, but rightly so because a lot of the same, uh, the usual suspects were, were apparent here as in the heat stress section. So what I want to get across mainly is that the sweat response is, uh, is there and intended to dissipate the heat that you generate during exercise, and it's variable. It's individualized. We have average values, but there's a really wide range of possibilities. You can lose a lot of sweat, you can lose a lot of sodium, you can do both. It's very individualized. Fluid lost in sweat will compromise blood volume if you don't replace it. Blood volume is the source of fluid to generate sweat. And if you don't replace it, you get that redistribution of fluid that compromises blood volume and eventually compromises cardiac output. The body tries to divert blood from the skin to the exercising muscle. So even though we're in this situation where blood volume is low, it's so important to the body to continue to exercise that we pull blood away from the skin. We shut down the, uh, the sweat rate, we shut down skin blood flow, and in doing so, accelerate the increase in core temperature. And it's this increase, this hyperthermia, that seems to be the operative factor in reducing performance, reducing skills performance, 
reducing cognition, accelerating glycogen use, just like we saw last section. But there's, there's hope. There's light at the end of the tunnel. You can create a hydration plan that's specific to your fluid loss, your sodium loss, that could theoretically keep you from ever becoming dehydrated. And we're still working on what should the recommendations be? So let's say that each of you has your own individual plan. Does that mean whenever you go to run in the summer or you're playing hockey or you're, you're at squash, does that mean that you should always replace all the fluid and all the sodium that you lose? It's probably pretty hard to do that. You have to train yourself to drink that much fluid just like you have to train yourself to exercise. Is there a bit of wiggle room? Could you wait? and allow some of that to happen in recovery. The application of the individualized plan is, is really what we're working on now. But we can create individualized plans. So pretty cool stuff. Um, that's it for this section. Everything that we've covered in this first half of the course up to and including today is eligible for the midterm on Tuesday. You've still got a nice four days to, uh, to really cram everything together. I've got office hours tomorrow. I'm always in my office. Even if uh, you can't make office hours, stop by. Send an email if you want to, if you have questions that are specific that I can respond to by email. Um, send an email to set up a time outside of office hours to come in and, uh, and chat. That's totally fine. If there's no questions now, call it for the day. Have a wonderful weekend. Maybe one question. Yeah. Format for the midterm. Very good question. Uh, I can't give you a definite answer because I haven't finalized it yet. But in the past, I've, I've kept maybe 10 or 15 multiple choice and mostly done short to medium answers. And usually the first test or the first midterm um, in a course, I, I tend to like to do only short answers. So there might not be too many multiple choice. But they're typically things like, what are the five objectives of the sweat test? And it's basically five points for a five mark question. Or um, describe why core temperature increase is exaggerated when dehydrated. So you've got to pull back some information, some knowledge of why core temperature goes up, what happens when you're dehydrated that specifically impairs core temperature and thermoregulation. So a bigger picture question like that might be like the capstone question. Uh, but mostly one mark per point that I'm looking for, and they're usually in the three to seven, three to eight mark range. Emphasis on those types of questions. Few multiple choice maybe to warm you up, but I like those uh, short to medium answers for, for third and fourth year, fourth year classes. Good question though. We have, um, what do we have, an hour and a half-ish, 70 minutes, 75 minutes. So I like to do in total, certainly no more than one point per minute. And I usually try to get to two thirds, like I round it down because for me, if, if I can, if I say one point per minute, I've made the, the test and it's easy for me to know what I'm looking for. And so I round it down maybe two thirds of that. So uh, 40 or 50 points for the midterm in total for our class. In a normal 50 minute period, it might be 30 marks or something like that. But um, that's the kind of length that we're looking at, too. Fair? All right.